I want to talk a bit more about how we make a project stack up in the real world. Um, and we're at Atelier firm believers in um, a, a sort of new procurement model called the ECI, or Early Contractor Involvement. Um, so I'm really going to focus on that um, and really talk about it as, a, at a, as an innovative way of um, procuring a project or going through the design and tender process. So first, I just want to introduce our business. Um, not sure if everyone's aware, but uh, it's about three to four years old. Uh, it was formed by a group of industry experts with a wealth of experience, very much focusing on innovation and smarter ways of building. Um, so even though we do uh, deliver a, a diverse group of or types of projects, we're very much focused on a project being innovative. Um, it doesn't mean it has to be mass timber. It's anything to do with prefabrication, modular construction because we really have a, a firm belief in that the industry needs to change. Um, we've been progressing down a path for a very long time um, with very little innovation and um, uh, our business really believes that it's, it's ready to change and that innovative ways of building and also procuring builders, um, buildings and builders um, is really important to that change. Uh, on numerous presentations I've made, you may have seen, if you have or haven't seen me present before, use this slide. Um, Previously, I've talked about it in relation to innovative ways of building. Today, I want to talk about it um, in relation to the procurement model um, and the way we, we've traditionally procured buildings, designed buildings, um, got builders on board and built them. And as you can see there, the construction industry is lagging behind significantly um, in relation to other industries and um, it's clearly ready to change. I'm, I'm a big fan of this quote and I think it really reflects where we sit within the construction industry at the moment, um, mainly here in Australia and other parts of the world as well. Um, and we cannot solve the problems with the same thinking we use when we created them. Now I use this in analogy again with different ways of building but also with procuring. So we've got, we, we do have challenges in the procurement model um, and I'll go through those in more detail and we really feel that it needs to be looked at differently um, away from the traditional design and construct, moving more to a collaborative approach and this is a way that we can actually solve those problems. So what are the different uh, procurement models? Uh, there's, there's four, uh, probably three of which are, are more relevant. You've got a traditional lump sum tender. Not much of this is happening at the moment in the industry. Um, design and construct is the default position. Majority of projects that are procured and tenders have gone down a DNC process. A build the transfer model, um, not very common, but does exist in small, small areas. And then you've got your early contractor involvement. I very much want to compare these two. So compare the default option of a DNC and compare that to what we believe is the most efficient and um, uh, collaborative way of procuring a, a project is through the, uh, the ECI process or early contractor involvement. So let's focus on the, on the current default setting. Um, I've tried to summarise it pretty simply in, in, a, in a table, as you can see, just, just quickly working through each of these stages and I'll hone in on each of the, the critical ones. A developer purchases a development site, a developer appoints an architect, architect develops town planning documents. Town planning documents are lodged, town planning documents are approved. Now I'm sure that stage takes a bit longer, probably ends up at VCAT and a bit of argument, a bit of argy-bargy, but eventually they get approved. Developer then appoints a project manager, um, sometimes, um, or they run it themselves, as well as other consultants. Design development and tenor document process um, commences. And the percentage at which they take design development varies. Um, depending on how much the developer wants to have say in the design, generally the percentage is higher, but a lot of the time we find it sits between 60 to 80 per cent. Then it goes out the builder tender, they try to find four to five, sometimes six, sometimes seven, sometimes three, but on average let's assume it's four to five builders. That gets tendered over a four to six week period. Uh, the builders then submit their tender packages. Tender, rev tender packages are reviewed during a period of time. Builder is appointed. And then the critical part here is the consultants are then novated to the builder. And the builder takes responsibility for the delivery of the design. And then construction commences. Again, that end bit takes a bit longer than I've just said it, but gives you, gives you an idea. So let's hone into each item. So first we want to talk about the architects uh, develops the town planning documents. Now during this phase, um, the really key component here is really try to develop an efficient design that aligns with the development budget. Surprisingly, um, a lot of the time this doesn't happen. 
Um, and the question is asked, how are construction costs compared to the actual development budget during that phase? Now, how many architects we got in the room? Okay, I'll tread lightly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, if, if an architect is given the sole responsibility of designing a building to a budget, um, I believe that's very difficult, especially in the space we live in at the moment in the construction industry, with prices escalating, resources being an issue. Quantity surveyors are struggling at the moment to really hone in on how much buildings cost. And we're finding them overcorrecting, undercorrecting, and trying to find this space. So if a, if a quantity surveyor is struggling to find out or work out how much a building costs in the real world, how is an architect supposed to do that? Okay, so it's a really important point. And it's, and it's, and it's the first opportunity the builder has to actually, as a consultant, contribute some value to the process. Okay, the builders are the best people to tell you how much stuff costs when it, when it talks about building. All right, so getting a builder involved in this point is, is really, really critical and doesn't happen very often. And the other side of it too, it's the first point of almost no return. So once you've lodged your town planning documents and they're approved, you don't really want to go back and change them. And you really want to wait to the end of this process to realise that you can't build it for the cost you wanted to build it in the first place. So moving into the next section, it's developing um, the appointment of a, a project manager and or consultants, sorry, and consultants um, over and above the architect and a development of the design and tender documents. So it's really important to note here who negotiates the deal with the consultants and who is actually responsible for the design during construction. So what we find a lot of the time, the developer appoints consultants, they have a negotiation, a scope and a price determined and they tell them how much they want to um, how much design they want to develop. And then they get novated across to the builder after the tender process. And a lot of the time there's a lot of discussion around that novation document. Is it really 80%? Have you got enough money in the kitty to finish the design? What other VM options we've identified? Is there redesign required? And all of this contractual stuff that, that Paul mentioned, um, really it's not just the head contractor with the developer and the, and the builder, it's also involved in the, the arrangement with the consultants. Yeah, and it becomes really messy for the consultants as well in this really difficult scenario because the design does shift during this process. Talk about the 80-20 rule or the 60-40 rule or whatever the percentages are and it really touches on what I said before. Is the design really 80% complete? Is there only really 20% to go? Um, and a lot of builders don't really delve into this detail and get bitten um, during that novation period after, or after the novation period during construction. And again, a builder can really add um, a lot of, can assist here as a consultant during the design to make sure it's getting, it's, build, you know, it's buildable. You know, are we thinking about access? Are we thinking about how big these panels are or whatever during that construction process or the design process? So then we move to the builder tender stage, this um, awesome stage for us as builders. Um, I want to talk about the tender matrix. This is something that um, uh, our managing director, Jason O'Hara, um, feels very passionately about. Um, I'll go through this in a bit more detail, but it's really about how extremely wasteful and inefficient this process is, not just for the client, the developer and the project, but for the entire industry and how it's wasting so much time and money, which someone is actually paying for. Who? I'm not sure yet, but someone is paying for it. There's really minimal consultation with the project consultants. Value management, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail as well, is so critical because as a builder, if you don't put VM options forward, you won't win the job. So you basically sit there with a red pen, try to find holes through the design and try to rape and pillage it to get the price down as low as you can or you won't be competitive. We also appoint other consultants to do risk and opportunity analysis with the intention if we win the job, we get rid of the current consultant and bring ours on. So that's not really efficient either. These guys do that for almost nothing with the intention of winning the job. And the builder's margin contingency and prelims are really, really critical here because if everyone prices it exactly the same and looks at it and, and interprets it and understands the job exactly how it should be interpreted, the only difference is margin contingency and prelims. So if you want builders to start cutting on that, you know, that's when you start cutting on safety, you start looking at um, reducing margin and trying to screw your subbies and all of that sort of stuff and it really starts becoming a messy process. 
So let's look at this tender matrix. So a bit of math, it's not complicated. So it's um, pretty simple mathematics. Assuming there's four to five builders, um, there's generally about 28 to 32-ish trades. So when you talk about trade categories, it's demolition, it's, it's concrete, it's steel, it's render, it's paint, it's kitchens, it's carpet, it's landscaping, so on and so forth. And to get subby coverage, we develop a, a matrix where we look at, we want to get four to five subbies per trade. And depending on how many we get, we then increase our contingency. If we've only got one quote for every item, it's high risk. Because by the time you call the guy up and say, here's the contract, he goes, I'm busy, I can't do it. Okay, so it's a huge element of risk. So when you do the math on that, you do five times 30 times five, which is 750. So 750 people or organisations are involved in a particular project tender. And let's assume there's some overlap there. So some builders are calling the same concreter, some builders are calling the same tiler. Um, so let's cut it down to 500, let's say, okay? One, only one builder wins that job and only appoints 30 of subcontractors. So only 30 people win in this whole process. You divide that by 500, you're running at 6% success rate. This is extremely, extremely wasteful and costs a lot of money. And this is why when us as builders are tendering jobs and you've got this, these computer systems that just flood the whole market with drawings and ask everyone for tenders, very few subbies actually spend a lot of time on it because they're getting called from this builder plus maybe two of the others, plus every other tender out there. And they're just getting inundated with these stuff, the quote, and they're just trying to pump it out, just do rates, get it out there. They're not really looking for efficiencies during that process. Okay, and during that process too, they're only winning a very small percentage of it. So one, would you invest the time and effort into it, firstly, and two, it's costing them money. Every, all the subbies and supplies, it's huge estimating departments, just pumping work out. So someone has to pay for that. So it goes onto, the top, onto their bottom line, it goes to the cost of the product, so on and so forth. You can see this enormous mess of a matrix happening here, which really costs a lot of time and money. So on top of that, we look at value management. And as I said before, it's a must. If we don't do it, we won't win a job. Um, other consultants carry out a lot of these risk assessments. And the actual current consultants are not generally consulted during the tender process by the builder. Because we're very paranoid they're going to ring up the other builders and tell them. Got this great VM opportunity. We're going to reduce the slab by this. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We don't tell anyone. We don't tell the project consultant because they might tell someone else. We lose our competitive advantage. So I said, the va value management is really the only competitive advantage we have. So we don't tell the project consultant and we don't really, have we factored everything in the current design that actually means we can apply this VM option? Because the best people to ask are the actual designers who are designing the building. Yep, so that makes sense. So there's not much collaboration during that process. And is it really value management? In four to six weeks, we're going to look at a job that's been designed 80% by all these consultants, and in four to six weeks, we kind of only really start getting our quotes back in the last week, and then we value manage it to come up with a figure. It's, it's not value management. I'll answer that question for you. Okay, getting to the last few points, tender review period and builder appointed and consultants novated. This is, uh, this is when it all comes home the roost for the consultants um, and the builder. The, what's, what's really interesting here, in all my time um, being at Attilia, which is only 12 months, mind you, it's not a huge sample size, we have not come across a job after tender that has hit budget. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm really challenged to see how many out there, and if they are, the developer will jump all over it because the builders probably missed something. Right? So that's the first feeling we get when we get a phone call from a developer. Yeah, you're, the, you're first in line. We're like, shit, what do we miss? <laughs> it's, it's really, that's what happens. Um, so it's generally over budget. So you don't, get, you don't get selected. You get nominated as the preferred builder. Okay? And then we put all the VM options in front. We meet, we meet all the consultants and we say, Here, this is what we've done to your design. Your facade's no longer that. It's FC sheet. We've done this, we've done that, just to try to get down the budget. And we're not even there yet. So let's get more VM options to try to get it down to the budget. And then the, then the consultants turn around to us and say, look, you can't actually do that because of this BCA requirement 
and the MFB have already authorised that and was in some fine print in the four million pages of tender documents we received that we didn't read. Um, and some of those VM options we can't actually implement, so we need more VM options on top of that. And through this whole process we end up um, getting to a point where everyone's, you know, not, then it's not all win-win for everyone, let's say. And we negotiated, um, we're pot committed as builders, we want to get it across the line, so we negotiate, we get to a point, and then everyone gets innovated to us. And this, you actually start building it then. Yeah, so on top of that, with this VM options, you generally have a lot of redesigned, so we have to negotiate with the consultants to say you've only allowed 20%, all our VMs equal 50, so, but there's not enough money to pay you to do all those designs. So all this process becomes really messy and, and, and doesn't work really well. So if we were looking at that DNC process and said, where can a builder actually get involved? These are the mainly the three areas before we get the builder tender. Where can she get involved as a consultant? Like, God forbid, pay a builder to be a consultant. You know, who'd want to do that? Um, but I generally believe that's an option that could be looked at. So look at a builder being a consultant. Actually pay them a fee like all the other consultants and get them to actually give construction advice. The fundamental flaw with this proposal is that no builder's gonna do that knowing it's gonna go out the tender and all their IP and all their smarts is going to everyone else anyway. So if you are getting a builder involved through an ECI, which I call a token ECI that's going to build a tender, they're not gonna give you everything anyway. They're gonna keep a lot of it in their back pocket trying to get an advantage, so when the tender comes, they go crunch, they know the design, and try to beat everyone. Okay, so you're not really gonna get that efficiency. Very similar process, I've highlighted in orange, I think that's orange, um, the areas of difference. So developer purchased at a developer site, developer points an architect and a preferred builder. You can see the difference there. Architect works with the builder to develop town planning documents. Okay. Builder completes a high level cost plan and compares to the development budget before we've even got it to town planning. Uh, the town planning documents are adjusted based on the cost plan analysis. So the hardest thing here for the developer is actually to put their development budget on the table to the builder. This is the biggest point of resistance. But any developer would know how much they need to build it for and that's how much money they want to make. And it's very, very rare in this market you're actually going to get lower than that anyway at tender. So put, put it out on the table, talk about it, and that's actually designed to it and use a builder as a consultant to get you to that budget before you even lodge at town planning. So then we go, town planning documents are lodged, town planning documents are approved, a bit of argy-bargy there. Um, now the, then the developer engages the builder on an ECI and they agree on a target construction budget. Now, a lot of the time that's agreed at lower than what was said at the start. Because any builder was going to look at it, put a bit of contingency, because the design isn't even developed yet. So there's an agreement, and that's a mutual agreement. If they can't agree, we move on, take it to tender. Okay? Because the builders only really contribute a little bit of town planning. They haven't done the detail, assisted in the detailed design, so there's not much outlay there for the builder at the moment. So once that's agreed, developer then works with the architect and the builder to appoint other consultants. Right? So there's a big collaboration happening here. Who works well to, with each other? What have we done in the past? And I want to talk about that in a bit more detail later and how well other industries have done this. Then the detailed design is completed to 100%. So we're de-risking the whole thing. We're designing it to 100%. It's finished. This is where BIM comes in. This is where prefabrication, you actually factor all of this in. And there's regular costing milestones. So maybe at 60% we'll do a cost. Are we tracking well? Yes, no, let's adjust something. 80%, 100%. So you're not waiting to the death to see how much it costs. There's regular communication with the developer during that process. And the other key point is key subbies and suppliers get involved. We are starting to develop ECI agreements with our subbies and our suppliers. So what we're doing is we're getting rid of this tender matrix. We might tender it out to three or four, say it's CLT, Go and speak to three suppliers. Let's talk to them where you're at. Can you do it? Can't you do it? Where's the price at? And then you pick one. And you sign an agreement with them that aligns with your contract. And you bring them on the journey. And you do that for 60, 70% of your total construction cost. So the risk is really being distributed across numerous people, numerous organisations. And these subbies will give you everything. 
They've, their job's already signed up. They've got a target budget. They'll give you the resource. They'll give you the people. You'll actually get efficiency out of that process. Yeah? And the other key component here is actually completion of, I haven't mentioned this yet, but protection work notices, construction management plans, building permits. A lot of this stuff can't happen until you've appointed a builder, and they take a lot of time. Certain jobs, protection work notices, you can't really hang your crane over an adjacent property anymore. Anyone with any sense can delay your starting a construction site because you'd put in an anchor underneath their property and they're a, they're a lawyer and it just drags on and on and on and it costs a lot of money and you lose all this time. And the clock's ticking because you've been appointed and you're paying prelims and, and it just, it's a really bad way to start a job. So incorporate that into the process because right at the end when you've got a final construction cost confirmed and you're still signing a D&C contract, the contract doesn't change. It's still a D&C contract. So when you actually sign it, you start the, not quite the next day, but the lawyers might you know, rack up some fees going back and forth a bit, but um, you actually sign a contract and start construction, which benefits everyone. And then the consultants are innovated across and construction commences. And generally there's minimal design work to be cried because we've aimed for 100% and everyone, that innovation's a really happy time because everyone likes each other. So when we talk about the ECI time advantages, when you look at a traditional, this is a lump sum model, but when you look at a traditional procurement or tender model compared to an ECI, there's significant savings there in that VM process, that redesign process, and that commencement of construction. And through our experiences, we're finding it's between eight to 14 weeks. Yeah, so can you imagine as a builder going in and going at a hard nosed tender and you win the job and you're 14 weeks faster than everyone else? They'll, you know, that's a lot of money. So let's incorporate that into the start and offer that as a saving at the start. So I've touched on a lot of these, um, but it goes through the, the ECI process and where the advantages are. It's much, much more collaborative um, procurement model. Um, the, the project design intent is maintained. It's a really important point, and the architects love this. And the amount of times I've spoken to architects about it, and the next thing they know, they've rang me the next day going, yeah, got a job, I want you to meet the developer. Let's talk about ECI. Because they're actually involved in that design and they, they want to protect that design, which is fair enough. And, and to their defence, if they're getting guided the right way about the design, look, that's a bit too expensive, they can actually still maintain that design intent. It's not getting jolted by a builder during a, 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 a tender process. The builder is paid as a consultant and they actually add value when it matters. Um, extremely efficient, less wasteful because we get rid of that tender matrix. Um, the developer gets the budget and design they want. Yeah, it's really, really important. And it de-risks the project with respect to cost, time, quality, constructability and commercial arrangements for everyone, for the consultants, for the subbies, for the builder, for the developer. It's completely, de say completely, there are, will always be risk in construction, but it's significantly more de-risked. Now the point I wanna make here um, at the end of this is it's, it's about repetitive learning and repeat business, okay? Every single ECI we've delivered has resulted in repeat business and another ECI and they get more efficient as you get going and you bring the same teams on and the same subbies and it becomes a significantly more efficient process moving forward for everyone. So being ready for change is not just about innovative products, it's about innovative ways of looking at projects and procuring projects and designing them. So going back to this graph, I really want to focus now on, on that procurement design process and, and look at how the manufacturing industry has done it. There were clearly leaps and, um, leaps and bounds ahead of us, a lot of what Paul spoke about um, in manufacturing, a lot of what Christoph spoke about in timber manufacturing over in Europe, and to see where, where other industries are at. And you look at the car industry, and yes, they've got innovation, there's robots and you know less staff and all that, which is a good and bad thing, I suppose, but the key point here is that they've, they've, the learnings they've developed have improved the product over time. So you drive a car in the 60s compared to driving a car now, it's a better car. It's much, the product is much better. Are our buildings much better? Anyone? Yeah, they, they are. They are, but not to the extent 
as the car industry or a phone. Look at the phones back in the 60s to where they are now. Computers. All of these other areas that have had, yes, we've had some innovation, but nowhere near as much as these other people and other industries. And, it, and it's very much about how they've, they've designed stuff and just constantly improved it. Could you imagine if, a, if, if, if uh, say, Mazda went and tendered every one of their car models to different manufacturers, different suppliers, different designers? How much your car would cost? I don't know if you watch The Simpsons, they did once that for Homer. Homer designed his own car once and it was a total disaster. But, getting off the point, but <laughs> if we start looking at this from a construction perspective and start repeating the same teams and learning from our mistakes and having that repeat learning process and repeat business, it's going to improve the way we design and think and construct and deliver buildings. And this is where we see ECI as really an opportunity to do that, to start getting that, rep that repetition in the process to deliver much better products like other industries in manufacturing have done. So um, I, I started off in construction, I then went into manufacturing um, and now I'm back into construction again and I had to take a step back for the first 12 months and watch us as Atelier tender on jobs and I had this vision of a dog chasing its tail. Right? And we really need to stop doing that. We need, to, we need to just stop chasing our tails and actually start being productive, not only as builders but as an entire industry because that's the way we're going to start allowing collaboration to come in, allow innovation to come in and increase the quality of our buildings and delivery of our buildings and reduce the costs as well. So thank you. <laughs>